You mentioned the ambition this year in terms of managing supporters' expectations, top six. You know, I actually think that you were playing such good rugby that arguably top four was well in the grass. But I think now you start signing these players and the pressure potentially starts coming on, the expectation of the crowds, the sellout crowds. How difficult is that going to be to manage as you go into, we don't know what, if this, is, this season will finish, but say we start again next season. I, I honestly see you as one of the favourites for 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 the Premiership because of Semi Ran Randra and Charles Piatal being fit. You brought Nathan Hughes back through and Sinclair and and the array of talent that you've got in your team that have come through. How does that change the dynamics of the team and and the way that you coach it, having the pressure, I suppose, to do as well as maybe is expected for them players? Well, I put it on myself right from day one when I put together the five year plan uh, for Steve and Chris. Um, and in that plan, every year the bottom line has gone up um, where we need to, to finish. Now, I know going on the previous history of Bristol rugby, if I had came in and said, right, Steve, the plan for the next five years, I'm going to keep Bristol in the premiership for five seasons. Uh, he probably would have signed that off. But that's not the way that it works. So every year I put in a, a bottom line on what that looks like. And I won't say what it is here. But it's pretty tough. But what it forces me to do, and, and I suppose I learned this when I got sacked, is that you, it forces me that there's good people that have come and gone. and But ultimately, the only currency that we all have is, is, is performance and high performance. You know, there's um, – if and so – if everyone, as I said on day one when I got in, people said, well, how are you going to get Bristol back? How are you going to make them consistent? Well, everyone, players, staff, if we all as individuals aim to get better and, um, you know, by asking what have we done well, what we could do better, regardless of uh, what we do, then the then Bristol rugby is going to get better. And, you know, so I've had to, you know, and, and be really challenging and separate relationship from performance and, you know, making sure that, I'm asking myself every question when I'm having one-on-ones, is this the best? Can I? Can you get more? And if it's not and someone else can come in and do that, then we'll, we'll have to make the changes. Because at the end of the day, what we're trying to put in place is a structure and a world-class system that's reliant on no individual. So if Charles leaves, the next guy has to come in and do that. Uh, if Pat leaves, the last thing we want is suddenly to wipe out everything that we bring the next person to build on. So when I'm looking for replacement and staff, you know, at the moment, um, if I'm looking at a role, there's a lot of people going for it. And some names that are going for some of the roles are really high. And I know if I put that name out, people go, oh, that's great. But no, I'm looking for the right person to fit the role and the, where we currently are as a team to make sure that this is sustainable right through. Um, so the pressure, when you ask that question, is already I already put that on myself and everybody else. So we drive the ship that while well, our culture is, uh, is really important, it has to be a high-performance team. And... The new facility that we're about to go into is unbelievable. It's a game changer. And we'll get you guys down there once once we're all back in to have a look through it. Um, that, that, again, when you walk in, you know, some of the staff already feel, said, I feel the pressure that my performance has to be here to live up to what we're about to go into. Well, Pat, half a million pound, mate. I'll run through a brick wall for you and the one next door to that as well, mate. I'm loving it, mate. Oh, I want it again. I was going to say, Pat, I put my CV in to be the nutritionalist, but I didn't hear back from you, so I don't know, I don't know, I don't know yeah. what went wrong with that one. Yeah, it didn't, it didn't make their first hurdle, mate. <laughs> well, we have got a good kitchen, mate. A good kitchen. Oh, there we go. Well, I'll definitely come and experience that when, you, when you're open. Um, last thing from me, really, then, obviously, um, as... So director of rugby head coach, the, the plans are ever evolving with the pandemic that's going on. Um, can you just give us a bit of insight, if you can, at the minute you might not be able to, about what are the current sort of steps being taken? I know there was reports this week that um, it's been put back another week so you can train together, uh, potentially in small groups. One, how hard has that been for you? But two, what, what does it look like? What do you see potentially as an end goal to when we can get things up and running again? I think if everyone said to us at the very beginning, right, you're going to be away for nine weeks and then we'll make a decision. But that would have killed a lot of people. And very similar like a game. We, we looked at this again. We just got to go game to game or training to training, if you like. So the beauty, and I'll go back to the plan. I mean, our head of medical guy, Rory Murray, is world class. And Kev Gary, head of athletic performance, world class and all the stuff. The plan that they put together is for every scenario. 
I mean, we had a scenario right from, we had five stages before the government put out their, their stages. We knew and we gave everyone clarity what's going to happen. And we're now at the stage where we're prepared to go back. If they said, right, you're back in tomorrow, we're ready. If they say we're back in going to be a couple of weeks, we're ready for that as well. And and those guys are right in the middle of these discussions. I know we got a, we got a meeting on Wednesday to find out a bit more with the PRL, but we're ready to go. And, um, and if anything... You know, it's around working out if it's a bit delayed and, and because of the amount of work that the players and staff have done now, if it's a means a little bit later, in my head, the less games that come, because we did such a good job, all it means is you've got less, less games to try and win it, if you like. So it's just keeping everyone stimulated as we go through. And again, that's where the connections and the culture comes in and keeping everyone on, on task. Pat, just before you go as well, it'd be good to get your thoughts on the Pacific Island nations being a proud Samoan international. Uh, we had Gus Pichot and we had Bill Beaumont on talking about the, the growth of the game. I know you're here in the Premiership and, and that's keeping you busy, but I'm sure you've got a firm eye on what's happening over there. Obviously, Charles Piertau, we mentioned, uh, we, we, we've spoken about him. There's a lot of talk about him potentially going back to play for Tonga, having played for New Zealand. What are your thoughts on this whole residency thing and, and the kind of finances and the funding being put towards Pacific Island nations? Well, it's interesting. I always found it interesting now the Southern Hemisphere teams are, um, you know, asking for shared revenue gate. I remember when I was in Samoa, we were asking that of, you know, even New Zealand and Australia, if we could get some as well. So I think they're starting to feel the pain of the Pacific Island. If anything, it's brought everyone back down to realise some of the issues. I think the big thing, um, I'm a big fan, hopefully, of the global calendar. Well, let's get that right. I mean, it's and and um, you could have a really good season. I mean, I, I am a big fan of summer, summer rugby. If we ended up going that way, and um, you know, finally getting home for Christmas for uh, would would be nice too. But I think getting all of that aligned would be great. Um, I think as far as the Pacific Island, I think once you get the calendar right then it makes everything else be able to fit. So if international rugby set aside at a certain window away from the, the clubs, then the next bit is about growing that international game. So allowing players like Charles Piertel, allowing the, the Stephen Law to teams that players that have, who can't play for their t uh, tier one or aren't selected. I mean, there's players who've only played one game that could go back and help the island nations. And it might only be initially, but it just brings that level up and, and real interest. So rather than you know, generally five or six teams that win, we start to really grow that game. So it might be just the beginning, but eventually the, the ones that are coming through locally will, will, will be fine. So that, that's my view, that um, the more we can do for the Tier 2, the better. Yeah, good stuff. And the final thing I'll ask you then, Pat, uh, I know it's massive uh, down at Bristol. Uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic at the minute and, and social distancing is really important, but the handshakes, they're just going out of fashion now, aren't they? We're not going to be allowed to handshake, which I know is a big driver of something down at uh, the Bristol Bears with how you greet each other. Have you thought of anything else? Is it going to be a pat on the arse? Is it going to be uh, you know a little touch of the foot? How, how's it going to go down? Yeah, I think if you strip that all back and, and you can take the, the, the physical contact, but the reason we do that is to connect. You know, it's the connection. So even if it's the, you know, the old island, the old island where used to be, they'll raise the eyebrows like that, you know, but there's so many different things. I think the main thing, the purpose behind it was to make sure you connect. And even in the new facility, you know, I was very blessed to be allowed, uh, Steve allowed me to change the whole flow of the inside of the building. And basically, when I was able to sit with the architects, talk about the culture that we want, that I don't want anyone isolated. So when you walk in, the flow is fantastic. I gave them a typical schedule to be, we can be efficient with our time. But more of the big thing now is that we'll be all able to have meals together and the way that everyone's able to connect. So I think the big thing when players come in, there's about three or four entrances, but we'll go through one way because it forces you to see the reception the same morning. You know, how you doing? Go through to certain offices, everyone say hello. So it's the actual effort of making the connect, even if you take away the physical touch. And don't get me wrong, it's uh, that adds to it. So once that comes back, they'll be found fantastic, as long as we don't lose the actual purpose is connect with everybody. All right, Pat. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. Best of luck navigating your way through the remainder of this pandemic and, of course, uh, the remainder of the season, whatever that looks like. Uh, fellas, thanks. I just want to say awesome having me on. It's a great show, a lot of very popular, so very privileged to be invited. Thanks, fellas. Keep doing a good job.